Welcome back to BEFM Drama, where we turn great literature into gripping radio. I'm your host, Joshua Cornwell, and today we're bringing you part five in our five part adaptation of The Six Napoleons, a classic Sherlock Holmes mystery from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes has unraveled a bizarre mystery involving the theft and destruction of seemingly worthless plaster busts of Napoleon throughout London and the murder of an Italian mobster named Pietro Venucci. Through his brilliant powers of deduction and investigation, Holmes has brought the perpetrator, an Italian laborer and petty criminal known as Beppo, to justice. But the mystery of why the plaster busts of Napoleon were targeted in the first place remains unanswered. Join us now as we return to the story and resolve these final questions here on BEFM Drama. A moment after the bell rang, we heard footsteps on the stairs, and an elderly, red-faced man with grizzled side whiskers was ushered in. In his right hand, he carried an old-fashioned carpet bag, which he placed upon the table. Is Mr. Sherlock Holmes here? My friend bowed and smiled. Mr. Sanford of Reading, I suppose? Yes, sir. I fear that I am a little late, but the trains were awkward. You wrote to me about a bust that is in my possession. Exactly. I have your letter here. You said, I desire to possess a copy of the Divine's Napoleon, and am prepared to pay you ten pounds for the one which is in your possession. Is that right? Certainly. I was very surprised by your letter. I could not imagine how you knew that I owned such a thing. Of course, you must have been surprised, but the explanation is very simple. Mr. Harding of Harding Brothers said that they had sold you their last copy, and he gave me your address. Oh... That was it, was it? Did he tell you what I paid for it? No, he did not. Well, I'm an honest man, though not a very rich one. I only gave 15 shillings for the bust, and I think you ought to know that before I take 10 pounds from you... Your honesty does you honor, Mr. Sanford, but I have named that price and I intend to stick to it. Well, it is very generous of you, Mr. Holmes. I brought the bust up with me, as you asked me to do. Here it is. He opened his bag, and at last we saw placed upon our table a complete specimen of that bust which we had already seen more than once in fragments. Holmes took a paper from his pocket and laid a ten-pound note upon the table. You will kindly sign that paper, Mr. Sanford, in the presence of these witnesses. It is simply to say that you transfer every possible right that you have ever had in the bust to me. I am a methodical man, you see, and you never know how events might turn. Thank you, Mr. Sanford. Here's your money, and I wish you a very good evening. When our visitor had disappeared, Sherlock Holmes' actions riveted our attention. He began by taking a clean white cloth from a drawer and laying it over the table. Then he placed his newly acquired bust in the center of the cloth. Finally, he picked up his weighted hunting crop and struck Napoleon a sharp blow on the top of the head. The figure broke into fragments, and Holmes bent eagerly over the shattered remains. Next instant, with a loud shout of triumph, he held up one splinter in which a round, dark object was stuck like a plum in a pudding. Gentlemen, let me introduce you to the famous Black Pearl of the Borgias. Lestrade and I sat silently for a moment, and then, with a spontaneous impulse, we both started clapping, as if at the climax of a play. A flush of red sprang to Holmes's pale cheeks, and he bowed to us like the master actor receiving the homage of his audience. It was at such moments that for an instant he ceased to be a reasoning machine and betrayed his human love for admiration and applause. The same proud and reserved nature, which turned him away in disdain from popular notoriety, was capable of being deeply moved by the spontaneous wonder and praise of his friends. Yes, gentlemen, it is the most famous pearl now existing in the world, and has been my good fortune by a connected chain of inductive reasoning to trace it from the Princess of Colonna's bedroom at the Dockray Hotel, where it was lost, to the interior of this, the last of the six busts of Napoleon which were manufactured by Gelder and Company of Stepney. 
You will remember, Lestrade, the uproar caused by the disappearance of this valuable jewel and the failed efforts of the London police to recover it. I was myself consulted upon in the case, but was unable to throw any light upon it. Suspicion fell upon the maid of the princess, who was an Italian, and it was proved that she had a brother in London, but we failed to trace any connection between them. The maid's name was Lucretia Venucci, and there is no doubt in my mind that the Pietro Venucci murdered two nights ago was her brother. I have been looking up the dates in the old files of the paper, and I find that the disappearance of the pearl was exactly two days before the arrest of Beppo for some crime of violence. His arrest took place in the factory of Gelder and Company at the very moment when these busts were being made. Now, you clearly see the sequence of events. Beppo had the pearl in his possession. He may have stolen it from Pietro, he may have been Pietro's accomplice, or he may have been the go-between for Pietro and his sister. It doesn't matter to us. All that matters was that he had the pearl on his person while pursued by police. Precisely. He made for the factory where he worked, and he knew that he had only a few minutes to conceal this enormously valuable jewel, which would otherwise be confiscated when he was searched. Six plaster casts of Napoleon were drying in the passage. One of them was still soft. In an instant, Beppo, a skillful workman, made a small hole in the wet plaster, dropped the pearl, and with a few touches, covered over the hole once more. It was an excellent hiding place, but Beppo was condemned to a year's imprisonment, and in the meantime his six busts were scattered all over London. He could not tell which one contained his treasure. Only by breaking them could he be sure. Even shaking would tell him nothing, for the pearl would be adhered to the plaster. Beppo did not despair, and he conducted his search with considerable ingenuity and perseverance. Through a cousin who works with Gelder, he found out the retail firms who had bought the bus. He managed to find employment with Morse Hudson, and in that way tracked down three of them. The pearl was not there. Then, with the help of some Italian employee, he succeeded in finding out where the other three bus had gone. The first was at Harker's. There he was caught by his old acquaintance, Pietro, who held Beppo responsible for the loss of the pearl. Beppo stabbed him in a scuffle which followed. If Beppo was his former accomplice, why would Pietro carry his photograph? As a way of tracking him if he wished to ask about him from a third person. That was the obvious reason. Well, after the murder, I calculated that Beppo would probably hurry rather than delay his movements. He would fear that the police would learn his secret, and so he rushed on before they could get ahead of him. Of course, there was a chance that he had already found the pearl in Harker's bust, and I had not even concluded for certain that it was the pearl, only that it was evident that he was looking for something valuable, since he had carried the bust past the other houses in order to break it in the garden, which had a street lamp shining upon it. Since Harker's bust was one of the three, the chances were exactly as I told you, two to one against the pearl being inside it. There remained two busts, and it was obvious that he would go for the London one first, with Reading so far up to town. I warned the residents of the house so as to avoid a second tragedy, and we went down with the happy results you've seen. By that time, of course, I knew for certain that it was the Borgia Pearl that we were after. The name of the murdered man linked the one event to the other. There only remained a single bust, the Reading one and the pearl must be there. I bought it in your presence from the owner, and there it lies. We sat in silence for a moment. Well, I've seen you handle a good many cases, Mr. Holmes, but I don't know that I ever knew a better handled one than this. We're not jealous of you at Scotland Yard. No, sir, we are very proud of you. And if you come down tomorrow, there's not a man from the oldest inspector to the youngest constable, who wouldn't be glad to shake you by the hand. Thank you, thank you. As he turned away, it seemed to me that he was more nearly moved by the softer human emotions than I had ever seen him before. But a moment later, he was the cold and practical thinker once more. Put the pearl in the safe, Watson, and get up the papers of the Conk Singleton forgery case. We'll see if we can't return this pearl to its former owner and kill two birds with one stone. Goodbye, Lestrade. If any little problem comes your way, I would be happy if I can to give you a hint or two as to its solution. With that, we've come to the conclusion of our five-part adaptation of these six Napoleons here on BEFM Drama. The mystery has been resolved with the discovery of a priceless black pearl found embedded in the plaster of the sixth and final head. The criminal Beppo had hidden the stolen pearl in one of the heads moments before being arrested, and after a year in prison, he would stop at nothing to track down each one until he had recovered his ill-gotten treasure. 
Through his brilliant deductive reasoning and forensic talents, Holmes has brought the mystery to a close and now basks in the admiration of his friends and colleagues. We hope that you've enjoyed our adaptation of this story and that you'll join us again for a special compilation broadcast on Sunday when all five episodes will be aired together as a single compilation. From the studio in Busan, this is your host, Joshua Cornwell.